I apologize for the delay there. A little technical issues on my end, our end, as it were. We will get started in just one second. Thank you for your patience. I truly appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Let's get moving. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I truly appreciate it. My name is Joe Rokup, Managing Director of Commodities and Equities here at Simpler Trading. Today, we will be presenting on the Critical Crude Update, exploring what actually happened this week in the market of crude oil and crude oil fundamental suites. So without further ado, a little bit about myself. I am from, uh, went to school at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, my degree is in engineering. I also double majored and got a degree in business. Professional experience includes a NYMEX trading floor, proprietary trading, commercial and physical trading, uh, and I ran a small education company for a while. So my experience is a bit different than uh, some of the other content providers here at Simpler. Uh, you know, I started, moved straight to the, moved straight to Manhattan out of college, spent some time on the trading floor. I was on the propri proprietary and hedge fund side of trading. And then I was also doing the commercial and physical trading. So I was trading actual barrels of crude oil. And my specialty during this time has, in fact, been crude oil. Okay, hobbies include soccer, yoga, meditation. I find that these are all very helpful and very useful uh, in my trading. Reduces stress and keeps me nice and relaxed. So here's what we're going to learn today. How did crude go negative? That's a crazy concept, right? How can a commodity be worth a negative value? Uh, what were the critical factors that pushed crude in this direction? Who are the main players involved? Okay. How does this affect me? What can I do in this market? You know, how can I trade this market effectively? Uh, and those are the things we're going to discuss. So I hope you're all excited. Time's going to fly. So I'll try and move as quick as I can and answer questions either along the way or at the end. Uh, but feel free to post some questions, and I'll see if I can get to them. All right. So what happened? NYMEX crude oil, which expired on Monday. Okay, the May 20 futures plummeted below zero. COVID-19 and OPEC plus supply gut. Glut helped push the May-June spread into uncharted territory as the May 20 expired. Okay, so COVID-19 and OPEC Plus, they were, they were a big part of it. So what does that mean? Uh, let's take a look at the numbers first. CL May 20 finished the day on Monday at a stunning minus 37.63 per barrel, breaking from the settle on Friday of 18.27. Okay, so... Quick math there, crude oil broke $55.90 in one day. Massive, right? Massive, massive break. Historical, if you will. Rent, which is the actual true international benchmark, also fell. It also broke. It only broke two and a half bucks. Did not take into negative toy or come even remotely close for that matter. And why is that? You know, given the fact that Brent crude oil is more widely used around the world, more volume is traded, why wouldn't those two trade in conjunction? Well, Brent's May-June rollover occurred 20 days prior. Brent's rollover is at the end of the month, whereas the CL rollover is at the beginning of the month. In addition to that, uh, another little factor is that the storage for this grade of oil or for Brent oil is not in such support, not in such short supply as compared to the NYMEX WTI grade. 
Okay, so here's just a quick trade example of some of the stuff I'm going to be showing you, how we did it, uh, what we're looking for, and how one can profit from, from these types of big, crazy moves. So this is a spread, right? So this spread is the June SEP spread. Uh, on Monday, we were talking about the May-June spread, which came off, right? It plummeted, it plummeted, it plummeted. So the following day, it would only be natural we get some sort of snap back, right? All gaps must be filled. So what we did is we bought the June SEP spread here at negative 13.15, okay? And spreads are reversed here in crude, so I just want to make a note of that. Uh, we sold one a dollar higher at 12 and a half, and we scaled out on the way up every dollar, and then we got stopped out of our last one down here. So buy four, sell, sell, sell out. PL on that was 8,000, risk was 4,000. So big, big numbers here in that risk reward, but I want to make sure you folks know uh, you don't have to risk the full 4K. You can trade smaller, you can trade with the one lot, or you can trade with the QM. But this is just an example of how we can look to profit from these, these you know, unprecedented conditions and these and these and these big moves. Okay. So what are the critical factors and and what made oil plummet like that in one day? Well, demand. Let's of course take a look at demand. The physical demand uh, for oil has significantly decreased around the world, and that's got to be obvious, right? Billions of people are staying home. Industry is declining, and those estimated decreases in demand levels are 20 to 30 million barrels per day, and that's actually getting higher. Okay, I'd like to make a quick note when demand levels are changed in their forecasts, it's usually half a million to 1.5 million, and this is 20 times that. So, this is a, a big change versus what you normally see in a standard de deviation of change. Uh, so that's demand. This is supply, right? It's demand and supply, the two biggest factors in price. Uh, and this is about OPEC plus, okay? So crude prices have been in a free fall since late February, right? They've been going down, down, down. A bounce here or there, but it's been a bearish market. Now, if you're familiar with OPEC, okay, OPEC stands for Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, okay? And there's a they paired up with a few other countries that are not officially a member of that group. Uh, and those countries are Russia and a few others, right? And they're collectively known as OPEC plus. Now they had an agreement for the last two years on how they've been cutting supply, okay? That agreement was up for renewal in March and they failed to come to the table uh, with an agreement, okay? So there was a spat between Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, and those are the pig, the biggest two players uh, in these agreements, okay? And there was a price, price for, and that pushed us down even further, even further, even further. Um, and then they did come to an agreement uh, recently on April 12th. The United States stepped in, and there was production cuts, uh, which, of course, is affecting supply, went into effect. However, the numbers were a little misleading. They announced a production cut of 10, you know, about 10 million barrels per day. But if you look further into the numbers, you'll see that that's not exactly what happened. And let me just quickly show a blog that I wrote. And you guys can take a look at that later if you want to get a little more information. So, and it's on the screen there, but what you need to know about crude oil. And OPEC. And so there's a nice long blog that explains it. Uh, I won't go into that detail at the moment, but if you want more information, uh, take a look at that. And let's keep rolling here. So, another critical factor GDP. If energy prices are low, right, that should be generally that's great for the economy, right? It's good for the GDP because it costs less to produce something, which in turn contributes to that increase in the gross domestic product. However, this is a big however, because there was already a pre-existing supply gut, glut, this lack, um, this new lack of demand only added to that oversupply, okay? So there was not a big boost in the economy from this low energy cost because the economy was already in the free fall, 
Okay, so here's another a trading example, and this was from last Wednesday. Okay, I like I get a lot of good signals on Wednesday. Uh, on Wednesdays, that's when the EIA or the DOE supply numbers are released for the crude oil fundamental suite. So not just uh, not just crude, but also heating oil, gas oil, which are the products of crude. Um, the chart you're looking at is a VWAP chart, and I'll get into more specifics later. But I just want to show you what we were looking at. We we're looking to sell one CL here at 1993, popped back up before it hit our target. We added one more lot. Market came back down and sat on this level of support. Boom, we took one off and then held that trade for about an hour or so, and then it came back up and we got stopped out. Made 710 on that with the risk of 360. Much different magnitude of cash risk than the previous trade I showed you. Um, so we've got trades that fit all different sorts of people, all different size of accounts, and different time frames. Okay, so let's look at one more quick factor here, Cushing, Oklahoma. Okay, and I've got some visuals for you guys. So supplies at Cushing, Oklahoma, which is right here, uh, have risen. What is Cushing? It is the central hub for all oil in North America. As you can see by these maps, right, there's pipes, pipelines to Cushing from multiple areas. It's coming from Canada, from the north. It's coming from the Gulf. It's coming from the south. Uh, it's coming from Illinois, Indiana, coming from the east, coming from Colorado, coming from the west. You know, it's that hub. And, uh, you know, most of the oil that is used in the U.S. goes through Cushing, okay? So we can look at Cushing as a barometer for oil storage around the states, okay? So first of all, storage levels going up, okay? Refinery rates going down, which means refinery rates, and this circles back to what we spoke about before, when the oil is flowing here into Cushing, it goes through a refinery and it's cracked out and it's turned into a usable product like Arbob or gasoline. Uh, but those rates are down, so crude oil supply continues to rally because it's not being used. In addition to that, the products that were already produced are not going out. So that's another critical factor there and a nice barometer of how to of how to measure what the supply rate is going to move. Now, one cannot talk about the market, of course, in any sense without addressing COVID-19. Uh, and COVID-19 has an impact on crude oil, of course, of course, of course. And the way we look at this is we look at the relationship between ES and CL. So you could also look at the YM versus CL. And you're just looking at, you know, a futures versus futures, apples versus apples correlation, okay? And cr the crude oil demand, of course, is a direct function of the health of the global economy, right? Both the U.S. and international economies. So there's the catalyst for equities. And these are some interesting little, uh, interesting little words that you're going to see, but the words are vaccine, treatment, testing. So keep those in the back of your mind. Economies reopen, shape of recovery. Okay, and here here's an example. So on Thursday, I'm going to go ahead right to the chart. Okay, so this was Thursday, right? This was yesterday. Uh, what happened yesterday? Well, it was announced midday uh, that a company called Well Gildyed. Uh, it was announced released the drug. Okay. Uh, well, this drug had already been called, released. Excuse me. Well, first trial flopped. Uh, it was announced midday. The drug. So the drug okay. well, 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 the drug was unsuccessful. Well, this drug had already been called. When the news hit the tape. Well, first trial flopped. It was announced midday. So the drug was unsuccessful. Well, this drug had already been called. Boom. Down. Three minutes. This thing just plummeted. Knee jerk reaction, right? Um, the study was terminated due to low enrollment, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is just a study, not a big. You know, it wasn't, you know, we weren't leaning on this, but one potential solution was off the table and boom, we dropped. Okay. So, what I'm, you know, what the takeaway from that is there is a big correlation between the two. Okay. And, and if we were to lay an oil chart on here, 
then we would see a a continued break. Now, let's go up. And if you're worried about the company and the drug, here it is. Excuse my pronunciation. All right. So critical factors of that break last Monday. Uh, where did the buyers go? So there was a lack of follow through on oil purchase promises made recently by the U.S. government. Uh, and it left the market with no big buyer to step in during the rollover period for this May contract on Monday. So what does that mean? Lack of lack of promises, purchase promises. So on March 13th last month, President Trump declared a national emergency due to COVID-19. Uh, he also stated that the DOE is pledging to buy large quantities of oil to fill up the SPR to its full capacity or near it at about 714 million barrels. I think they plan to buy about uh, 75 million. Okay, so at that time he announced that uh, CL was trading about 32 bucks, okay? And again, that was last month. Over time, of course, price dropped, price dropped, um, kind of giving the opportunity to buy oil at record lows. Um, however, what happened? Well, Congress blocked that proposal, that $3 billion proposal, um, it was seen as a bailout of big oil, okay? And that was pulled out of the uh, stimulus package. Uh, leading up to the uh, leading up to the bill, uh, Congress, you know, so added some provisions uh, and the both sides of the aisle weren't able to come to an agreement, unfortunately. Uh, so the pledge uh, didn't go through, okay? Well, that's democracy. Um, what was the result? Well, the bill failed in the House, okay, and thus the U.S. did not post a bid and fill that SPR. So the oil companies who are expecting there to be buyers, right, on Monday, um, because that bill failed, there weren't buyers, and crude fell off. Makes perfect sense, right? A big, massive chunk of buyers were no longer in the market. Uh, and I'd like to note that because you actually have to buy and take physical delivery of the product. There weren't speculators in there to try and, to try and pick that up because they're not able to even buy that expiring physical contract. Okay, so let's talk about the CME. Um, was the exchange behind this move? Was there some political inside baseball? So obviously the move uh, might not have seemed pretty to some, uh, but the suite worked as it should have. Uh, despite uh, this historic descent uh, for the now defunct contract, um, you know, may settled at that unprecedented level. However, no one should have really been under the perception that futures can't go below zero. Why? And we're going to talk about cost of carry uh, versus a immediate value, not to mention cost of production. So we got a farming analogy here um, that I'll show you, and I'm sure everyone's. Uh, been watching the news and you know has seen has seen this type of image where milk's being poured out right because they have no way to move it there's not enough people to buy it right the the the, the price that they're looking to sell it at um, does not cover the cost of carry to ship it okay so what do they do they dump it in their fields or they pour it down the drain Right, similar thing with vegetables. You know, they rot and then you know they bury them for fertilizer. But you can't do that with crude oil. You can't pour it down the drain. You can't let it rot. You've got to do something with it, right? So you've got to pay someone to take that off your hands, and you've got to pay someone to put it in storage, which is expensive because storage is limited at the moment, right? Eventually, it's going to get capped. So there's premiums being charged on that storage. In addition, in addition uh, to the to the low price of oil, right? So that pushes that higher that price higher. Okay. So real quick, let's talk about what expire is and what rollover is. Okay. So when a futures contract approaches expiry, the owner of said contract or the trader has to determine if he or she wants to sell the futures contract in the electronic market or keep it in real life. Okay, let's say it's electronic and they want to roll it over, right? What they do is they sell it electronically and then they buy the following month. Pretty easy, 
pretty easy, uncomplicated thing, right? So typically rollover, not tricky, right? But in this falling economy, very few traders want to take possession of that crude oil. Now, someone made a comment that we have huge storage tanks. We absolutely do. Um, but the price that people are charging versus the cost of carry is going up, right? Also, how long do we want to keep that oil in there? And that's tricky, okay? Um, thus, if there's no speculators willing to buy, then that means the people who are going to hold the oil, they're not willing to buy it either because the price is going to continue to tank. So even if we had infinite storage space, which we don't, this still would have happened, okay? All right, so given the fact that I've been trading oil for a decade, decade and a half, you know, I feel that this fundamental knowledge of a product is key, okay? If you've got this knowledge and understanding, um, it can give you a massive, and I mean really massive edge versus the typical retail trader, right? Because we're not just trading on technicals, we're also trading on fundamentals. Uh, so the knowledge and understanding definitely gives you a bias to lean on when you're entering your trades because uh, it increases the probability of profitability, right? If you can back up your technical signal with a fundamental viewpoint, that should help, right? Okay, and so that's one of the reasons, you know, I'm doing this presentation. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm, you know, showing some of these trade examples. Okay, so how would I trade this market? What should you do when you're trading this market? And the answer is simple, be a sniper, right? Stay patient, hide out in the weeds, and then strike when your setup comes to fruition, okay? Here's a few methods that you wanna look at. Use spreads, okay? The spreads was that first trading example I showed you. Use spreads when the market is volatile. Why? Because it, the spreads are less volatile than the outright itself, because you're buying one thing and selling the other. So the volatility is reduced, so that can help keep you from not getting um, ticked out of your position. So that works nicely. You want to use wider ranges, right? And thus you need to use wider stops or vice versa, chicken and the egg situation. But you want wider stops, right? So if you're having wider stops, you want to reduce your size to accommodate for these wider stops so your monetary risk can be properly ratioed, can be similar. Okay, now here's one of the most important things. When the market goes crazy, take a step back, don't get FOMO. Your best trade's always ahead of you, okay? So given the fact that I've done this for a long time, I can identify those market conditions when you need to just step out uh, and let the, market, let the market play itself out, wear itself out, and then get back in the game, okay? So the simpler VWAP chart. Okay, this is one of the main charts I use and one of the main things we'll be talking about here today. The uh, pink line is the VWAP. The white line is a fast-moving EMA. The yellow line is a slow-moving EMA. Uh, and down here at the bottom is a CCI, okay? And we'll go into a little depth on what these are here, and I'll show you, you know, maybe how I use these live sometimes. I uh, like to do it on Wednesdays. Okay, so what is a volume weighted average? Um, a volume weighted average is just a nice fair value that you're seeing right across the curve here. Um, you know, and the aim of using this uh, is kind of a trending target, right? So we're looking at executing orders kind of does so in line with the volume of the market. Another thing I want to make a note of is that the VWAP acts as a magnet, right? You can see here that when it breaks, it pulls back. When it breaks, it pulls back. So that's a, that's something you want to be looking at when you're entering these trades, okay? Um, exponential moving average. So that places a greater weight on the most recent data points. It's similar to a VWAP. There's a different calculation, uh, but that indicator is used to used to produce buy and sell signals based off crossovers and divergence. So if you look here, when this fast EMA crosses the slow EMA, that would be a short signal, and goes under, okay? When the fast EMA crosses and goes over, that would be a long signal. Now, again, this you wanna use this chart as a suite of indicators. And you want 
all of them to say the same thing at once or four out of five or what have you. I always say a technical indicator on its own is useless, but if you're able to pair it up with other ones, then that's going to increase the probability of success for your trades. Okay. And lastly on this trade or on this chart, excuse me, is the CCI and that's momentum based or oscillator. Okay. And so that determines when something is overbought or oversold. All right. So when we're using this chart, why would you want to use uh, crude oil, right? Why would you want to use this chart with crude oil? Well, crude oil is a high demand global commodity, okay? All economic news and events in various market sectors can affect the price action. Thus, more volume will be traded, and the macro picture is going to be pushed and defended by big money institutions, okay? So one of the some of the market conditions we're looking for are reasonable volatility, meaning that it's not flying around up, down, left, right with no pattern. There's an acceptable risk-reward ratio, okay? There's other markets that are trending and are correlated, right? So if we're using this VWAP chart on crude, we'd like to use it on ES. We'd like to use it on YM. We'd like to use it on, you know, in the past, the dollar, if that was correlated. Um, and we, we'd, like, we'd like things to be nice and correlated, nice and tight, okay? So we're gonna now look at a long signal, okay? And these are the conditions, but I'll show you here live instead. Or excuse me, I'll show you on the chart. Okay, so conditions. Number one, we're looking for the fast EMA to be above the slow EMA, white above yellow. And we see that occur right here. Okay, we're looking for both EMAs to cross through the VWAP. Very nice. And we're looking for the CCI, which is down here, not to be overbought because we're going long. Right, so if the CCI was plus 200, uh, that means we're overbought. Okay, so you can see the CCI uh, is right in here inside this band, so we're good to go. All right, so this is a trending long signal. Now, uh, what's important about this particular signal, okay, is the entries, the entry signal based off of this chart say buy. Okay, um, we're buying one at 12.55, but what's important? here is our stop loss, okay? In this particular trade, we're risking 60 cents, okay? So our stop loss is here at 11.95. Now, under the stop loss, or near the stop loss, or under our entry above our stop loss are these levels of support and resistance, okay? So we've got one at a benchmark at $12. We've got one here at the VWAP, okay? So the VWAP, access support the benchmark of twelve dollars access support and this other h in this other supply or support and resistance level i got in is from uh a hva chart or market profile charts we've got three lines of defense here okay now because we're in these crazy market conditions okay we can try and find these crazy risk reward trades um, generally, we're looking for like two to three, four to five. If we can get a risk reward of one to two and have a decent hit ratio on that, you know, you're a star. But in this market condition, okay, we've got these big breakout trades. So that's something, you know, I like to help set you up with. And I believe this was from Wednesday as well. Uh, and you can see right where that uh, release was. Okay, and that jump. Now, <clears throat> we're looking to, in terms of our stop loss, there's a couple methods um, for our stop loss. The obvious one is uh, look to sell under resistance, okay? Uh, however, in this particular case, right, when we bought it at 1255, we were buying it with the expectation that the probability of it really moving was okay, right? It was high, higher than usual, right? Higher than usual market conditions. So this is the way we look at our stop loss. Move it to break even after the market moves 50% towards your target or covers your risk, okay? You can also use a trailing stop behind the EMA or just move it up with each level of support resistance. 
So the first option would be, here's our ultimate target, right? So we move it to break even after we got about halfway. Trailing stop would be to keep your stop about 10 cents behind this EMA, this slow EMA. If you did that, you would have gotten stopped out up here. But the one I like to use the most is moving it in conjunction with lines of support and resistance, right? So our first line of resistance was, was fairly close, okay? But based off of everything else that I saw in the market and based off of really the market profile chart um, that I might be able to show you at another time, um, there was a nice big horseshoe gap up here. So I was looking for that market to really slide. So when it went through this first resistance level, I brought my stop up here. When it went through that second resistance level, I brought my stop up here. Okay. <clears throat> now, had you used any one of those three stop loss, your results would have been pretty similar, um, almost the same. Uh, but in a market like this, where things have the ability to really move, I like using option three is waiting for it to violate that next level of support resistance. Okay. All right. Target notes, risk for risk notes. Okay. So <clears throat> here's another trending long signal. Same setup, right? Uh, at this point in time, we were in a, the daily trend was up. We made a high. We pulled back to the VWAP which is that magnet that I showed you earlier. We kind of pivoted around that, and then the EMAs crossed and went up. Both EMAs are above the VWAP, and we're not overbought on the CCI. Perfect long signal. Uh, the trend is up. Technicals say up. But what happens? We break. Okay, and we get stopped out at 1685. Uh, and this was a 20 cent intraday risk trade. If you look at the other, uh, I think was a, one of the other examples I showed you, these shorter term trades that are from like zero to 30 minutes, um, they're gonna have smaller risk magnitudes. So we'll risk like 20 to 25 points or 15 to 25 points on these short term zero to 30 minute trades. On the longer term trade, right, that I showed you up here, we have more risk, right, because we're expecting it to move farther, and we're going to be a little bit more passive. So that helps those of you who have different trading styles. If you like to be active and aggressive uh, during the middle of the day, we've got some for you. If you like to be a little bit more passive over the course of the day, we've got a little, we've got a little something for you too. Okay, so now for reversals, let's take a look at a reversal. In this example, we're going short, and we're going short against the daily trend, okay? So the conditions are the same but flipped, right? So we want the fast EMA to be under the slow EMA, okay? We want both EMAs to be above the VWAP, right? because we're going lower, we expect that to act as a magnet, okay? And here's one of the most important factors, right? If we are in a bull market or a temporary bull market, we're gonna look for that market to make a run, right? And then if, if, if it's topping out, right, we want, we want it to move kind of sideways and float there for a while, right? We're not trying to catch the top on a spike, like we're not trying to catch that or catch that or catch that. We want to see, we want to see the market float there and for things to start to look to turn lower. Okay. Uh, another thing that you don't see on this chart is that this move came from much lower. So it was a real big, a real big corrective move. Okay. Now, if you look closely at this a little closer, there are other instances in which we could have taken shorts, all of them, all of them would have worked out. But I wanted to wait for this downtrend or for this reversal to kind of be confirmed by that one particular statistic. Okay. Uh, and real quick, let's also talk about the CCI here. When this did pop, right? We see the CCI was over 200, so it was overbought here and overbought here. 
Okay, so it went through that plus 200, so that's another signal. Okay, so we wanted it to main, remain above negative 200, so it was not oversold because we still had these overbought signals. Okay, so what we did, once the fast EMA started to turn down with the slow EMA, um, and they started to diverge here. You see that little space here? They started to diverge. It also happened here, okay? So you definitely could have just entered this reversal sooner at a higher price. Um, but my, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, so I wasn't looking to um, try and guess the top and, and play this downside. But this is where we entered this trade, all right? We sold one at 17 half. We bought one at 16.32. What's 16.32? That's the VWAP, right? That is the VWAP. So we saw everything come right back to it. Okay, and on this risk reward, this was a one lot risk risk 600 to make 1800. Now, if you if you've got a different size account and say, oh, Joe, that risk is too much, trade the QM. So you'd be risking 300 to make 900, but you still have this one to three risk reward trade. All right, so stop losses are the same. Now, real quick for reversals, I want to just go over this very quickly. Um, the best case scenario is that you really, in my opinion, is that you exit at the VWAP, okay? Um, second best would be you exit at a level of support resistance. So in this particular trade, there's support below it, right? However, if this support was above it, I would have gotten out before it hit the VWAP, okay? Now, you can also use the trailing stop that we used in the previous one, pulling it 10 cents behind the slow EMA. Uh, and you would have gotten stopped out here, right? So uh, it's different of about 20 cents, but the risk reward still would have been pretty nice. Uh, so had you used any any of these, you you would have made money. Um, but the ultimate one here is, well, had you actually used the support resistance, you would have gotten stopped out up here. Um, so again, on reversals, if it comes back to the VWAP, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Kiss a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> I don't remember. It's Friday afternoon. I'm ready for happy hour. But um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm getting some some dirty looks and laughs at the same time. Um, so again, VWAP. All right, I've spent too much time on this reversal short, so let's keep moving on. Uh, defining ranges. One of the reasons I like this VWAP chart uh, is because it looks into volume. So it kind of looks inside of a five minute candlestick chart. Okay. When's the best time to trade crude oil? Well, we look to trade crude oil uh, between 8.30 and 10.45. Why? Because volume picks up at seven and dies down at 11.15. Because it's a volume based chart, we want to trade when there's the most volume. Uh, the analogy is if one person makes a bet, if one person makes one bet, I have no idea what they're going to do. If a million people, make a million bets, we can identify a pattern. Those of you who watch Ozark will find that quote familiar. <laughs> Those of you who are binging Netflix, like me and probably the rest of us. All right, <clears throat> so some of you may be asking, Joe, do you only trade crude oil? Uh, and the answer is no, I don't. Um, it's that jack of all trades analogy. Is it better to be a jack of all trade or a master of one. And I say, why not one, right? So I trade multiple asset classes. I use this type of indicator on multiple futures contracts and on stocks, but crude oil is my baby, right? Uh, I have the most knowledge of crude oil or I have the most comprehensive understanding. I do the most research, right? So market selection is key. And everyone will tell you that market selection is key. Um, you know, if crude oil is not doing anything, right, and it's too choppy, I'm not going to just force myself into crude oil. Uh, but if conditions look good, that's where I'm going to assign my risk. I'm going to assign it because you can only take so many trades at once, right? You can only follow so many markets at the same time. So I'm going to do what I know and look at crude oil, right? Now, I'm going to be using this chart on other products as well. So if I see something pop up, we're definitely going to take that, right? Maybe reduce some some our position in crude and, and transfer that 
that to a different product, definitely going to do that. Definitely going to do that. But when crude's rocking and rolling like it is, I'm using my fundamental bias. I'm using it with you folks. And we're going to look to take some nice, nice signals. So intimate product knowledge and understanding gives you a sound fundamental bias. And you'll learn this from me. So we lean on this bias when you take these technical signals, thus increasing the probability of profitability. Okay. So what are we all here for? Hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, that presentation that we've seen so far. Hopefully you learned a little bit uh, about the fundamentals, what caused that crazy crash, that historic event, right? I saw a little bit of the technical analysis that I do and how I enter my trades, uh, be it a spread trade, um, be it a crack. I primarily just showed you spot month futures there, right? I saw some questions about, you know, do you trade cracks? Do you trade uh, long-term future spread? Do you trade short-term future spread? And the answer is I do, right? I, I alluded to that briefly in the beginning um, on – how are we going to trade this market? Uh, and part of that is going to be with spreads, okay? Uh, but to simplify things for this presentation, I just wanted to show you futures. Now, all right, here is what's exciting. Come trade live with me Wednesday, April 29th at 9.15. What is significant about Wednesday? Well, at 9.30, the EIA release comes out, and we get some market action. Okay, so what's nice and what's fun about this is this is free. This is free. I've been trading crude oil and primarily crude oil for 15 years, decade and a half. I traded on the NYMEX floor. Uh, I traded for hedge funds. I traded for a prop shop, right? And we were moving massive positions. I was the leader uh, of several trading teams. Uh, I, you know, I worked closely with banks. I worked with uh, some of the larger producers, and we would do rollover, right? So I kind of left, I had this little story, but I used to do rollover every month with J.P. Morgan. So, and we would do thousands and thousands and thousands of spreads, right? And we do them in crude oil, we do them in Arbot, we do them in gasoline. So I've got a pretty intimate knowledge, right, of uh, how some of that works, and and you folks can use that to your advantage, and you can use it for free. So sign up for this this webinar, and let me give you a little insight into what we're doing. And you know, if if the market conditions are right, and we see some good setups, I'm going to call a signal out, and you folks can watch, learn, and see if I make a bunch of money or get crushed. <laughs> Or you can follow along with me live. You can trade sim, uh, whatever whatever makes you happy, whatever you think you're going to get the most benefit of. But the cool thing is, is that you're seeing this commentary, you know, that I'm regurgitating from a couple of weeks ago. But you're going to get it live and in real time. You're going to get these signals live and in real time. So you're going to get a little proof of concept, right? Uh, and as you know, as a retail trader, proof of concept is important. Right. You want someone that uh, can show you some nice, show you some nice results, or show you some nice setups. Now, again, all these strategies have a hit ratio, right? They're not right 100% of the time. You know, they're right 60%, 70%, 65, whatever. So, you know, we might have some, we might have some losses, we might have some wins, but ideally, those wins that we post are going to be pretty nice. Okay, so we're going to do the best we can on that. Um, now, let's see. Let's take a look at some questions. <laughs> I got some pretty funny ones. I don't know if they're appropriate. Um, it's about Columbia and Harlem, so I will actually <laughs> forego that one. Um, what time will I be trading till? Uh, probably about 11.15. Uh, the European market closes at 10:30. You'll see in, you'll see increased volume until about 10:45, and that's when traders are trying to kind of square off some of their positions. 11:15. Uh, that's when traders go to lunch, so volume dies down. So usually on Wednesdays, 
you know, I'm trading once once I have my position on in the morning and I trade that number, I'm usually not getting in or out of a trade between 11:15 and 12:45 because the volume goes down, right? And the market's kind of floating. I use volume-based charts, low volume, low probability. So over that period of time, that's when I'm looking for more of those wider risk reward trades, wider, but smaller size. Okay, central time, central time. So the, uh, the number comes out at 9.30. Okay. So what are the values of the two EMAs? Good question. Uh, one is a 10 and one is a 50. And those track the candles. And one more thing I want to be sure that I did mention is that this is a VWAP chart, okay? Volume weighted average. And each candlestick is worth 377 trades, okay? Um, it was tucked up here in the corner. Unfortunately, I, I failed to get into too much detail detail about that, but they're not five minute candlestick charts, they're trade candlestick charts. Okay, what does that mean? Every time there are 377 trades, a new candlestick is formed. Okay, so it's not a simple five minute or one minute. This gets inside because it's a volume based chart, volume based chart, volume based chart. Okay, hence why volume is so important. Okay, is it possible to trade options? Yes, it is definitely possible to trade options. Can USO go negative? No, it cannot. Is stock price cannot go negative. Um, what did USO have to do with the class into negative territory? Well, the USO didn't really have much to do with the collapse. The USO just tracked oil, right? And so some of the oil companies have already um been hurting right they've already been hurting because with the price of oil going down especially shale there's about 150 shale companies out there i'd say maybe 75 to 90 of them uh some of the smaller ones are going to have to declare bankruptcy because this because they're just not going to be able to cover costs they're not going to evaporate they'll be swallowed up by uh some of the you know some of the big boys but uh and to circle back to your question about the uso um the uso didn't push crude crude pulled the uso okay all right so yes i trade crack spreads absolutely um might be able to talk about that a little bit on wednesday okay um what specific futures contracts uh, are you trading? So when I was doing the spreads earlier, it was the June versus the SEP contract. Uh, the reason you would do June versus SEP is be, as opposed to June versus July or June versus DEES. If you do the June, July, that's the one, two, because you're not going very far back, right? You're still going to have a lot of volatility. And it's going to move real fast, and it might. It's not going to move as fast as the spot month, but it's going to move pretty darn quick. Okay, if you go to the December, okay, um, that December contracts, you're not going to get the magnitude of move that we would get out of something uh, right in the middle at the June SEP contract. So, in this environment, right, we're using spreads because we think futures are too risky and too choppy. Right, so if you go to the first spread, that's still a little too choppy. If you go six months out, that eh, still doesn't move quite as fast. Okay, so we want to go right in the middle, and that's why uh, we go out to SEP. So value of the EMAs, we covered that. So VWAP values. So again, um, the VWAP is based off of these candlesticks. Okay, so and. Another thing I'd like to kind of point out is that it's not a rolling VWAP from the day before. It's for this session. It's for the volume based in this session. Okay. All right. Let me see if there are any. Uh, oh, you know what? And to claim your spot, go ahead and click on this link on the bottom, www.simplertrading.com slash oil. Okay, so everyone, I would like to thank you for your time. 
TGIF to everybody. I hope you all had a profitable week. I hope you learned a little bit today. Uh, absolute pleasure having you. If you had to um, walk away and come back, this was recorded, so go ahead and rewatch. If you have some questions, feel free to rewatch the recording uh, or contact Simpler, and, and we'll help you out. But in the meantime, um, sign up for this webinar. It's free. Watch me trade. Uh, let's see some of this stuff in real time, and at the very least, you'll learn something, and it'll be a fun use of your time. All right. On that note, everyone have a great rest of your Friday. You have yourself a fantastic and splendid weekend, and thanks for coming. Cheers.